Thank you, David, for that introduction. Um, I'm really happy to be here with you. Um, it's an amazing thing that, uh, that we have these Temple of Mount Zion conferences and we keep going with them. And uh, I'm sure Matthew Brown would be pleased with um, this conference and uh, in memorial of, of his work and uh, all that he did. Um, everybody see that okay? All right, uh, I want to talk today about uh, a topic that I've been really interested in recently, and uh, I've talked a bit about this in other forms, so if some of this is a bit of a repeti repetition, uh, a lot of you I know go to a lot of these conferences, and, and I appreciate that. Um, so I'm sorry if some of it's been repeated, but I do have some new things to say on this topic. Um, to begin with, I wanted to mention that uh, we hear a lot of stories about individuals that ascend into heaven. Uh, we have the story of Enoch, uh, Melchizedek, uh, in the Joseph Smith translation, um, is, uh, we get some indication that uh, he ascended to heaven. Uh, Abraham, Moses, Elijah, Isaiah, Jesus, Paul, uh, in the, uh, the biblical and also extra-biblical, you know, pseudepigraphal literature, we get all these individuals uh, and the, the wonderful uh, stories of them ascending to heaven and uh, they see God and they're transfigured and um, these are kind of the, the stories that we hear when we talk about ascent to heaven. Now, uh, Elder Neil A. Maxwell, commenting on some of these uh, or the experiences of some of these prophets, uh, had the following to say. He said, according to the prophet Joseph Smith, the crucial holy endowment was administered to Moses on the mountaintop. Nephi, too, was caught up to an exceedingly high mountain and was instructed not to write or speak of some of the things he experienced there. So we get this idea that, um, you know, as Latter-day Saints, maybe there's some kind of comparison that we can be making between the experience, experiences of these prophets and uh, what we're doing in our own temple experience. Um, if, we, if we can call what Moses did on Sinai uh, the holy endowment, uh, then there's, there's a comparison to be made there. Um, however, when we think of the temple, and we think of our experience in the temple, um, we're often thinking of groups. We're thinking of our family. We're thinking of uh, the family being sealed. Uh, we think of a congregation uh, or a larger group of people um, doing uh, the temple ordinances. Um, I got that picture off of Google, so if that is your family, uh, I'm s sorry for not asking permission first. Uh, but when, when we think of our temple experience, uh, usually a, a better comparison that we could make is something more like what we see here with, uh, with Enoch and his people, his whole city, being taken up into heaven. Uh, because it's very rare for, for anyone uh, today to go through a temple-type experience, the, uh, the ritual ascent to heaven um, on their own. So uh, as I've thought about that, and as I've seen uh, some different things in the research I've done, uh, I, I've become interested in the idea of, uh, well, where do we see groups uh, being taken up into heaven? and having this experience that, that we are uh, supposed to compare with the Holy Endowment. Uh, so I've, I've picked out a few different uh, places where I can see uh, the idea of group ascension in the scriptures. And I won't go into these a whole lot, uh, just kind of briefly, but to show that the idea is there in our scriptures. Okay, so as I've already mentioned, Enoch and his city uh, the, all the people are supposed to be uh, taken up into heaven. Um, and as I mentioned, Melchizedek, in the Joseph Smith translation, and I think a lot of times this doesn't get noticed, you know, not as much as in the story of Enoch, but we get Melchizedek and his people in uh, Joseph Smith translation of Genesis 14. It says that they sought, they sought for the city of Zion, they sought for the city of Enoch, and they obtained it. It says they obtained heaven. So we get the idea that um, Melchizedek and at least some of his people 
are, are also being taken up into heaven. Uh, we get the story in Zechariah chapter 3 of Joshua the high priest, and it talks about his fellows that are with him. I'm going to go into that a little bit deeper uh, as, we, as we go on. You might not be familiar with that story, so, um, so I'll explain it a little bit better. Uh, we get the three Nephites, three of them together, being taken up into heaven and uh, you know, seeing things that they couldn't, um, they couldn't write or they couldn't speak about. Um, as has been mentioned before uh, in this conference, we have the, the story of Moses, uh, Aaron and his sons, and the 70 elders of Israel. Okay, now, of course, they're just going up the mountain, but uh, as we talked about, um, you know, this experience of going up the mountain and meeting God, um, as Matthew was talking about, uh, this is a, an ascent to heaven type experience. Um, and so we get this large group, you know, 70 plus people, uh, ascending and seeing the Lord. Uh, Peter, James, and John, their experience on the Mount of Transfiguration has been compared to the endowment as well. So we get the three of them uh, following Jesus up the mountain and uh, having this experience. Uh, and then one that I'll talk about a bit more in a bit, uh, the church or the believers in Christ um, are supposed to ascend to heaven following the example of Jesus uh, in the epistle to the Hebrews in the New Testament. Um, so we see the, these examples are there, but uh, they don't get talked about a whole lot. And so I want to explore the idea uh, a little bit more. Um, a couple of other examples that you may not be familiar with uh, that talk about groups ascending to heaven. There's a story called the History of the Rechabites. Uh, this is an early Jewish text. Some people uh, kind of debate whether it's uh, Jewish or Christian or uh, Jewish with Christian influences or, or what it is. But it's a very interesting story about um, a, a group of people uh, called the Sons of Rehab uh, who lived, um, I think, just before the Babylonian uh, conquest. And uh, they were being uh, pressured to break the covenants they had made. They'd been, they made very strict covenants with the Lord and uh, were very obedient to these covenants, but they were being pressured by the king to give up these covenants and to, uh, uh, to conform to the standards of the time. Uh, well, they refused and they were threatened with death. And so uh, what happened is the whole group of them, all of these Rechabites, um, were taken up into paradise. And there's a man called Zosimus who's allowed to, uh, to go up to paradise and see them there. And they're living there. It's a very, it's a very similar story to the story of um, the city of Enoch being taken up. Uh, and so that's, that's a very interesting story as well. Um, another one, uh, this comes from the Tosefta, or it's in the, both of the Talmuds as well. Um, there's four rabbis that were taken up into paradise, and they're taken up together, and um, three of them kind of are, perish or are injured along the way, and one of them is able to go through peacefully and return home peacefully, Rabbi Akiva. Um, but that's another example of, of a group. There's a group of four of them that go uh, up to heaven at the same time. And then... Um, there's a really interesting story in the first book of Job. That's uh, kind of a later Christian text. Um, some people would consider it to be Gnostic. Uh, but it talks about Jesus teaching his disciples how to navigate their way um, through the different levels of heaven. Uh, they're called treasuries. There's like each, each level they have to get through. And there's guards the, at the gates and they have to know the... Uh, the, the words and the signs and, and everything that they're supposed to tell the angels to be able to get through and, and go to the next level. Um, so Jesus is, is specifically teaching them, and there's some indications in the text that Jesus actually takes them up into heaven to show them how to do this. Um, so another example of this group uh, being taken up into heaven. And again, for some reason, we just we don't uh, really talk about these examples. Uh, but I feel that they're a lot more similar, or a lot more relatable to what we're doing in, in our own temple experience. Um, as I said before, I wanted to talk a little bit uh, more specifically about uh, the epistle to the Hebrews. 
And we, we read this, and uh, some of these things don't really pop out of, at us, but there have been a number of non-LDS scholars who have looked at the epistle to the Hebrews and have seen that there's something different going on with this text. Uh, it's, it's not just a story, it's, it's trying to present some kind of, um, of a ritual, even. Uh, the epistle to the Hebrews is structured around the ideas of Jesus Christ, high priesthood after, after the order of Melchizedek, his ascension into heaven, and enthronement in the celestial sanctuary. I apologize for my, my voice, I started to get a sore throat last night, and I've been talking a lot and wearing it out, so... Hopefully I'll be able, to be able to make it to the end here. Um, a main focus of Hebrews is the notion that the followers of Christ, uh, because he has ascended to heaven and, and been exalted, the followers should be able to do the same thing, uh, you know, going after his example. Uh, and so a lot of scholars have noticed this, uh, and, and they wonder what exactly is the purpose of the epistle, epistle to the Hebrews. That's trying to show this, you know, obviously there's a leader, there's followers, um, and, and a lot of them have uh, categorized Hebrews as some kind of teaching tool, um, some kind of uh, a, a lesson played out dramatically. Um, Harold Attridge called it an oratorical performance, or, or that's uh, how it was supposed to be read. Uh, Scott Mackey, Mackey has called it a mystical drama. Uh, several others, Luke Timothy Johnson, Sylvia Bunta, uh, and other, other scholars have described it as something like a symbolic participatory liturgy or ritual that moves worshipers from the earthly to the heavenly sphere. Okay. So this is not just a story about uh, Elijah ascending into heaven. This is something that the uh, worshipers were supposed to be hearing and somehow participating in. Uh, Mackey uh, thought that uh, it should be a, a dramatic performance because there are certain words in the text, such as behold, gaze upon, draw near, enter, um, like theatrical directions for somebody uh, to be ascending into heaven and, and to be participating uh, in, in this ritual in the heavenly temple. So this is how uh, Scott Mackey uh, has, has described the ritual that's happening in uh, the Epistle to the Hebrews. He calls it a divine adoption ceremony. Not, not necessarily just the adoption of Christ into heaven, but the adoption of, uh, of all of his followers into this heavenly family. So he, he kind of uh, picks at different verses throughout the Epistle, but this is kind of how he lines it up. He says, uh, there's a depiction of Jesus' ascent to heaven and entry into the celestial temple. Um, you know, you see the references there. Uh, a great high priest that has passed into the heavens. Christ has entered into heaven itself. Then there's a dramatic reenactment of the Son's exaltation, happening in chapters 1 and 2, uh, with lines like, Now see Jesus crowned with glory and honor. Uh, and also, God telling him to sit at my right hand. Okay, so we should be able to imagine this, so you know, people acting this out. Uh, the de declaration of familial relationship between the Father and the Son. Uh, Mackey calls this a naming ritual, where, the God tell, where God tells the Son, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee. The Son then confers family membership on the community, okay, his followers. They become his siblings. Uh, it says, Behold, I and the children that God hath given me. Uh, Christ declares that he is bringing many sons unto glory, and he's not ashamed to call them brethren. The community is then provided access to the heaven, heavenly temple by Jesus, their high priest. Okay, we talked a lot today, uh, Matthew Gray talked about uh, the priests um, facilitating this, uh, this journey through, uh, or journey up to heaven. Uh, type of thing in, in their synagogues. Um, so Jesus is their high priest, and he lets them into the heavenly temple. They are exhorted boldly, uh, they're ex exhorted to boldly enter the heavenly sanctuary and draw near to God's throne. Upon entry into the heavens, the Christian community hears the declaration, ye, ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, 
and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant. So you can imagine this. Uh, essentially, they're passing through the veil and into the heavenly holy of holies, uh, where they're received into the presence of God. Uh, Mackey concluded on this. He says, Hebrews depicts Jesus' exaltation as involving an ascent as he passed through the heavens and entered into heaven itself. He is also said to be leading many children into the same glory he possesses. Most importantly, the two key entry exhortations, 4, 14 to 16 and 10, 19 to 23, both com commend an act of entry that follows and imitates Jesus' own heavenly ascent and passage through the curtain, or through the veil. Therefore, a mystical heavenly ascent of the whole community would appear to be envisaged. Andrew Luth, another uh, biblical scholar, commented on this. Those Christians who embark on the mystical journey to reach God do so not individually, but as a community, as the body of Christ. Okay, so... Um, you know, what we're seeing in these scriptural passages is not just the idea that there's this one exceptional person, a prophetic figure, that can uh, ascend into heaven, but this is supposed to be at least practiced ritually uh, by the whole community. Uh, I found in my research that, uh, that these ideas pop up in a number of places, and this actually seems to be quite a common uh, concept in, second, in the Second Temple period, both in uh, you know, early Judaism and in Christianity. Um, it, it gets repeated, of course, as we've seen with, uh, with Hebrews. Uh, but I, I thought it was uh, quite significant uh, what Matthew Gray was talking about, and, and that there were synagogues where this type of thing could be happening. There's a floor plan laid out for this type of uh, liturgical or, or ritual ascent uh, in these Jewish synagogues. Um, so, uh, I'm looking at a period that's, you know, perhaps a few hundred years earlier than, than those uh, synagogues, but um, we're seeing it here in the text that they're describing these the same types of things. Okay, so we get the individual, uh, so backing up, what, what, I, what I've seen in a lot of these texts is the following. Uh, we get this individual who ascends to heaven and sees God. There's some kind of transfiguration, clothing, um, all of that. In heaven, this individual is taught the heavenly mysteries by God and his angels. Um, he is then appointed to be a teacher to share those mysteries with others. Okay, so he's supposed to come back down to earth and teach what he learned to other people. Those who receive his teachings are allowed to make the heavenly ascent and enjoy the same experiences as the teacher. Now, in LDS scripture, we, we see this quite a lot. With Enoch, Enoch goes to heaven, uh, he has visions, he comes back down, he's able to teach his people, and they all ascend. Um, Melchizedek, uh, it seems like that was happening as well. Jesus, of course, you know, the, the, these uh, Nephite disciples have seen him ascend into heaven and descend, uh, and then they do the same thing. The three of them ascend up into heaven. So, uh, so we get that in LDS scripture. Uh, but it happens a lot in other texts as well. Uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's some, some clear examples of this. Uh, there's a lot of talk in the Dead Sea Scrolls about a figure called the Teacher, the Teacher of Righteousness. Um, he's one figure, but it seems like they, uh, you know, this was kind of perpetuated. There's a teacher, he's sometimes called the Maskil. Um, some of the things said about the Maskil, uh, he shall guide them in knowledge and enlighten them in the mysteries of wonder and truth. He's designated to, teach, to instruct and teach all the sons of light. Leo Perdue has asserted that these motifs indicate that the elect who follow the true path are the initiated ones who understand the larger structure of the mystery of creation and history revealed to them by God through the proper instruction by the teacher or sage who has been inducted into this learning. Okay, so the, there's a teacher first, and then the students are able to follow him. Uh, in uh, the Hodayot, um, also known as the Thanksgiving hymns, or Thanksgiving Psalms, we get some really interesting stuff along these lines. 
Uh, and there, the teacher who has previously claimed a personal ascent to heaven then refers to a group of followers proclaiming to the Lord that they have gathered together for your covenant. Okay, so this is a, a covenant type meeting here. Um, and that he, the teacher, has examined them. Uh, he then explains that those who walk in the way of your, the Lord's heart, listen to me. They are drawing themselves up before you in the council of the holy ones. Okay? So this passage seems to indicate that those who are listening, listening to the teacher, likewise gain access to the heavenly courts. Uh, an, another uh, passage in the Hodayot, the teacher declares that the group of faithful followers, all the people of your council, have been brought by God into his secret council and in a common lot with the angels of the presence. Okay, so they're up in heaven communing with the angels. They become princes in the eternal lot and are compared to a great tree watered by the rivers of Eden. In Eden imagery here as well. Uh, the author envisions his community as being made princes in the heavenly assembly together with the angels of God's presence. Uh, I want to, to switch back to the Bible now and, and uh, go back to the story of Joshua that I mentioned. Uh, for some reason, this doesn't get picked up on it. I tried to look at all kinds of commentaries uh, on, on Zechariah 3. And uh, for some reason, this is uh, not noticed. Maybe it's because I'm re uh, reading too much into it. But, but this is why, what I get uh, out of Zechariah 3. It talks about Joshua the high priest. Was the high priest in the, the Jerusalem temple at the time. Uh, Zechariah 3 starts off depicting him as standing before the Lord. He's in the divine council. Um, he's dressed in these uh, grubby clothes. And uh, the, the members of the divine council come and change him into priestly clothing, uh, like the, the, uh, the heavenly clothing that they have there. Uh, God promises him, in verse 7, a place among these, uh, the members of the divine council, and then says to him something really interesting. Uh, so first of all, we're just kind of, we get the idea that Zechariah is there seeing this, but, but Joshua's in heaven. But then the Lord says, Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant the branch, to a messianic reference. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua. Okay, so, and it goes on and says some other interesting things, but I wanted to point out a few things. That um, a lot of commentators think that these fellows are, are the priests that work with Joshua. But there's no real commentary that, on the fact that Joshua is in heaven and the Lord's speaking to him. And, and apparently these fellows are there with him because the Lord's talking to them. He says, For behold, uh, I will bring forth my servant the branch. Uh, for behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua. So the Lord's talking to somebody else that's, you know, and referring to Joshua in the third person. So it seems to me like um, Joshua's fellow priests that work with him are also there uh, in, in the divine council in heaven, um, kind of watching what's going on with, with Joshua. So it's kind of an interesting little uh, thing there. Uh, moving back to the Dead Sea Scrolls now. Uh, I wanted to, to demonstrate that there is evidence for a dramatic portrayal of this group ascent um, that's, that's uh, not limited to the epistle to the Hebrews. Okay, we do see this in other places. Uh, there's a series of texts known as the Songs of the Sabbath Sacrifice, uh, also known as the Angelic Liturgy, uh, that were found at Qumran, among the Dead Sea Scrolls. But a copy, or at least you know, fragments of it, uh, was also found at Masada, uh, the Jewish fortress. So this is not something limited to these you know, secluded uh, monastic people at, uh, at Qumran. Um, so the Songs of the Sabbath Sacrifice, they contain descriptions of the various areas uh, of the heavenly realm. Uh, and it's kind of like a guided tour through heaven. And, and we see the angels, uh, we reach the celestial holy of holies uh, and the throne of God. We see the worship practices of the angels. We see uh, those who are participating in this clothed in uh, heavenly garments of the priesthood. Uh, when, when scholars have looked at this, it's kind of a puzzling text. 
But many scholars have come to the conclusion that uh, these songs are meant to represent a ritual drama, a ritualized ascent into heaven. Uh, Hakan Ulfkarg uh, said that, that the songs may have been intended to convey to the earthly worshipers the experience of being present at the continuous heavenly liturgy before the throne of God. Carol Newsom, uh, who's, who's done more work than about anyone on the, psalm, on the songs, she said, the songs of the Sabbath sacrifice provide the means by which those who read, who read and heard it could receive not merely communion with the angels, but a virtual experience of presence in the heavenly temple among the angelic priests. James Davila, uh, who was my PhD uh, advisor, uh, he, he argues that these songs were meant for liturgical use and refers to them as part of a weekly cultic drama. Crispin Fletcher Louis sees the songs as a conductor's score for not merely a descriptive heavenly tour, but a more concrete, ritualized heavenly ascent. Uh, finally, uh, Philip Alexander, um, commenting on the songs, he said, the communal chanting of these numinous hymns on successive Sabbaths was apparently deemed sufficient to carry the earthly worshipers up to the courts of the celestial temple through the nave and into the sanctuary, and to set them before the throne of God. Songs of the Sabbath sacrifice employs, uh, implies a communal ascent. If one makes the ascent, then one does so in a group. The self-glorification hymn, uh, which is kind of similar in, in theme to the songs of Sabbath, Sabbath sacrifice, uh, but talking about an individual who's uh, ascended to heaven and received glory, um, the self-glorification hymn, however, seems to imply that some individuals within the community, like Enoch and Levi, and other great spiritual heroes of the past, had made the ascent on their own. Such individual ascent was probably the exception rather than the rule. Okay, so I, I really like the Psalms, so I'd like to, uh, to go back to the Psalms um, and, and look at what I see is kind of uh, the background to all of this. What, I, what I've been talking about are uh, texts from the second temple period, you know, so after the Babylonian exile, uh, but a lot of people consider many of the Psalms to be pre-exilic. So we're, we're talking about the first temple here, um, if these Psalms go back that far. And, and what I believe is that this idea of group ascent was always inherent uh, to the worship of the first temple. And we can see that in the, the pilgrimage, the, the processions up to the temple, um, which have also been mentioned um, in this conference. Okay, so if we look at Psalm 89, uh, a lot of my dissertation was focused on looking at how the people of the Dead Sea Scrolls were interpreting the Psalms, what, what they were getting out of them. So Psalm 89 was seen at Qumran as, um, as often, at least certain parts of it, uh, referring to the notion of the ascent to heaven. Uh, so we see in verses 1 to 14 uh, of Psalm 89, the psalmist, uh, which we assume to be King David, it mentions the name David, uh, speaks as if he were in heaven, uh, singing praises to God for his mighty works. So he's seeing God and how wonderful God is in heaven compared to the other heavenly beings. Um, in verses 15 to 18, we start to see reference to the king's followers, who likewise praise the Lord, very similarly, and it, it uh, speaks to them, uh, saying, saying the following, Blessed are the people who know the festal shout, who walk, O Lord, in the light of your face. Okay, so, you know, there's, there's this transition to talking about these other people who are being taught something, taught something to say or something to shout, um, taught things to do, and, and they're walking in the light of the Lord's face. So, apparently, of course, they, they could be doing that on earth, but, but the, uh, the sense, at least, you know, from the people at Qumran, uh, are that this is all taking place in heaven. Um, Psalm 68, and I'm not sure if Camille's still here. Uh, Camille mentioned this. Uh, we see the mention of the girls. Um, Psalm 68 talks about this procession up to the temple. It says, Your solemn processions are seen, O God, the processions of my God, my King, into the sanctuary. The singers in front, the music, musicians last. 
between them girls playing tambourines. Bless God in the great congregation, the Lord, O you who are Israel's fountain. Uh, and then it talks about the tribes, you know, each tribe uh, in the procession going up to the temple. So we get the, the idea here that, that this, you know, if, if the uh, procession to the temple is meant to represent an ascent to heaven, we've got these whole big groups going together. This, this is not an individual thing. Uh, also in Psalm 68, we see them describing uh, the idea that the Lord is with them. Uh, with mighty territory, t twice ten thousand, thousands upon thousands, the Lord came from Sinai into the holy place. Okay, so they're reenacting this thing where the Lord's going with them. They're following the Lord up to the temple. Um, Psalm 47 describes this as well. The people are clapping, shouting, singing, because God has gone up, Allah, he's, he's ascended, with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Okay, and the people are just following right along. Uh, Psalm 84 it describes, I won't read the whole thing, it describes them wanting to be at the temple, going along this procession, um, uh, along the way, um, uh, the highways to Zion, it describes. Um, another thing I wanted to point out here, and sorry I'm rushing a bit, I've been notified that I don't have much time left. Um, it mentions they will go from power to power until they see the God of gods in Zion. Okay? And that's kind of my translation uh, based off the Septuagint. But there's this idea that, that these people in this procession are going from, from one level to the next, and their goal is to finally see God, uh, to, to meet God, as Matthew was talking about, uh, in the temple. Um, the interesting thing about the word power here, uh, it's the Hebrew word uh, chayil, which is actually related to, um, I just thought of that when, when Camille was talking, it's related to the word hul, uh, the dancing, the circle dancing that I was talking about. So I'm not really sure what the connection is there, um, but somehow there's, there's a type of dance going on, but also the word chayil um, can mean uh, an army, it can mean the captain of, an, of the army, it can also refer to the hosts of heaven. So what I get out of that uh, is that these people are moving from, from one angelic guardian to the next in, until they finally see um, the God of gods in Zion. Um, and, so, and just to go off of that, Psalm 118, also Psalm 24, I won't go into them, but they both talk about going through the gates, gates of the temple. And they talk about there being a leader, like Psalm 118, there's this leader, the, the one that comes in the name of the Lord, he requests for the gates to be open. And he also talks about the righteous, we brought up the righteous as well before, the righteous are supposed to go through the gates with him. And then Psalm 24 is kind of like that as well. They're going with uh, the, the king of kings and uh, uh, the Lord Yahweh through the temple gates. So just some concluding thoughts. There's some really interesting similarities between what we see going on in the temple, where we get uh, described these processions up into the temple, and, and what goes on in the later texts in, in the second temple period, you know, with Joshua the high priest and, and the thing, you know, the ideas at Qumran with the leader and, and him bringing up his followers into heaven. And, and we get that all the way into the New Testament with Jesus and, uh, and Hebrews. Um, I was recently informed that the Orthodox Church, they consider their liturgy, uh, the example was brought up uh, of the Eucharistic Assembly, um, they see that as, as the group participating in a, an ascent to heaven to, uh, to be in the presence of God. So somehow this, this idea has been with us all this time. Um, from, from way back in the Psalms in the first temple period, um, all through you know, uh, Judaism and Christianity, and, and we see so many parallels with our experience in the temple uh, today, that we can be together as a group, um, progressing and moving into the presence of God. Thank you very much.
and our group. Uh, is, are they, is Nell Kesey going to be a part of that group of Enoch? That's, that's a great question. And we don't ever get any other mention of it besides that little bit in the Joseph Smith translation. But I would assume that anyone that goes to the city of Enoch would come back with it. I mean, that would be my assumption. But uh, yeah, good question. Right up there? That's also what they do with the circles. I was thinking like the, doing the hijab in, in Mecca. But I think guys similar to something similar, like moving circles and stuff like that. Yeah, excellent. I, I think that's a great example. And, uh, uh, something that's definitely been carried on into that tradition. Um, when, when you mentioned that, I, I remember that um, Donald Perry has described, there's, um, there's a part in uh, Psalm 24, I think you have verse 4 or so, that talks about the generation that's going to see the face of the God of Jacob. Uh, Donald Perry said that that word, generation, should actually be, tra be translated as circle. So this, it's the circle that's going to see the face of God. Uh, so th there's definitely something going on there. Thank you. It, yeah, I'll I just a we'll brief comment. Uh, the Archegos in Hebrews, it's the title of Christ, and he's the you know, leader of uh, the company here. Now, it's interesting that the saints, when they originally, the, the Nabu temple was organized in companies, you know, in terms of thinking of the westward. The other thought was um, Revelation, when John talks about having a new name written, you know, on the those who overcome. We got the you got New Jerusalem written on them as well. And that sort of suggests a collective. I mean, because uh, naming somebody a city suggests that suggests they're a part of. Yeah. 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 Very good. I appreciate that. And Hebrews does go into that that. I mean, this is definitely, you're, you're going as a group to be a part of the city, you know, and uh, so, I, yeah, I like that. Thank you. Well done, David.